we continue to broadcast Dad's timeless and relevant messages from God's Word. You may explore our many resources at cwh.org. Today's message, What Does Real Love Look Like?, gives us different ways in which love shows itself in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. I'm Pastor Salem, and I want to welcome you to the Christian Worship Hour. And you just can't imagine how happy we are to be able to come to your house or your home and, uh, and uh, worship the Lord together with you. And all over the world, wherever you live, maybe you live in a tent, we don't know, it doesn't matter. We're all the people of God, and all of us who trust in Jesus. We're gathering around the feet of Jesus, and we're worshiping him. And we're going to be thinking about love today. What is real love? And if you have your Bibles, would like to follow along, you can get 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But let me just share some of the letters that we get. Here's a letter from Hot Springs, South Dakota, right here in South Dakota. I was preparing to write you a check for $50, she writes, and when I looked down, I'd written it for $100. I decided the Lord had decided on 100 so this is what I'm sending. Thank you for all you and everyone does. You have a wonderful outreach for all the Lord's sheep, including the lost sheep. And so that's what we always tell you. Just to ask God what you should give. Ask him if you should support this ministry. And, and then if he says yes, you say, how much? And he'll tell you. And he'll, he'll, he knows how much we need and he knows where it should come from. So we don't worry about it. Leave it with the Lord. Well, let's see. Here's Coco, Florida. And I hope you'll listen to this letter. This is a lady writing. She's been a Christian for a good number of years. And she says, please continue to impress on the people that we accept Jesus through faith and that feelings have nothing to do with it. Exactly. Nothing to do with it. Some people have feelings, but a lot of us do not experience this your sister in Christ. And that's what we just keep telling you over and over. You may have, when you accept Jesus and ask Jesus into your heart, you may just be happy and you may be just thrilled and you might get goose pimples and everything else. And then you might just doing as an agreement. You're talking to the Lord Jesus. He says, if you ask me in my, uh, my heart, he'll come into my heart. I did that 10 years old. He came into my heart and he's been there ever since. I didn't have a lot of feelings at all. I know the next day I felt like, oh, I was happy that my sins were all washed away. And so the main thing is that you just ask Jesus, say, dear Jesus, I'm a poor lost sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. And I ask you to come into my heart and take away my sins. And I'll follow you the best I can. And thank you, Jesus. And if you did that, you're a child of God. Just like that, feelings or not. Well, one more letter here is from Cambridge, Maine. This lady writes and said, I've been married twice. My first husband died at the age of 40. I remarried, but I still love my first husband more. Does this mean I'll see him first in heaven someday? Well, we do hear from people every once in a while, and they wonder if we've been married several times. How does that work in heaven? Well, the Sadducees talk to Jesus, and that's, they ask him that question. And they says, now here's a woman, and she, and she marries a man, and he dies, and he has seven brothers. And so the brothers are obliged to marry her, to ca carry on her title for the land, and so on. And, and, and so she has seven brothers. They have seven brothers. And she marries the first, and he dies. The second dies. The third dies. And they all die, so she marries seven brothers. And they said, now in the resurrection, he says, whose wife shall she be of the seven? And Jesus answered, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Matthew 22 and verse 30. Jesus did not say we would be angels. He says in the presence, we would be as the angels. We would be as angels, but we're not angels. And so when somebody dies, he says, now he's an angel. No, he isn't. If he's a Christian, he just has that, he just has that spirit and soul, and the body will be raised up later on, and he'll have that same body, only the glorified body. So he says we would be as the angels. So the angels are sexless. 
They're not married. They're not given in marriage. They don't have baby angels. And so when we get there, we're going to be like the angels. We're going to be sexless people, and God knows we're going to be... We're going to know everyone and we'll be, we'll be together. And then somebody says, well, what if my loved one isn't there? How will I be happy? And this, just like this, we could say it like this. When we're in ha heaven, we know that there's no sorrow and there's no parting and there are no tears and no remorse. And so it's just like this. You have a bucket full of water. It's filled to the brim. You can't put any more water in it. It's filled. And so when we get to heaven, our joy will be full and there'll be no place for sorrow or suffering. And so this is a wonderful thing we have, and you can have that hope if you have Jesus Christ as your Savior. Oh, it is so wonderful. I know I'm going to heaven not because I've been a preacher. Lord knows that isn't going to help me any, but it's because I accepted Jesus and was washed in the blood of the Lamb, and he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and he wants to do that for you if you haven't done it before. Well, now we're going to look at this uh, matter of, the, of, of uh, love. And uh, Paul writes a whole chapter on love. And we hear people say, oh, I'm in love. Oh, I, I love you so much. And the next thing you know, they're stabbing you in the back. And uh, what is love really? You, you know, like, for instance, I read about this one young man, and he's uh, as a teenager, and he sees a beautiful girl walking toward him at school, and he clutches his heart, and he says, I think I'm in love. I'm in love. And at the exact same time across town, an 80-year-old woman spends months by the bedside of her dying husband. And as he takes his final breath, she buries her tear-stained face in his hands and cries, Oh, how I loved him. Now, here's the teenager and the 80-year-old woman, and they use the same word, love, but they were worlds apart in their meaning. One with the young man was a counterfeit love. The other, the 80-year-old, was a real love, the real thing. The counterfeit love sees love as getting something. Real love sees us as giving. And there's a world of difference. So Paul talks about love in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7. And he says, for instance, he says, love suffereth long. Love, that is, love is very patient. This is the first quality that he mentions. And that word love carries on just the same. Love refuses to give away to anger, but quietly, silently bears it all. Sometimes it is unjustly treated, but it is never resentful and never strikes back. There may be wounds and hurts, but it never gets angry and strikes back and wants to fight back. Remember about Jesus? When he was reviled, he reviled not again. And when they crucified him, did everything they could imagine it to torment him and crucify him, he looked at them from the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. True love, true love then is the one that will just stay with us and is never to give up, never back off. And so then true love suffereth long and is kind. And it, to endure wrong may be just a triumph of a strong will. But when we return kindness for those that hurt us, we are showing really love. But that's the way God's love is. He's patient. And some of you, he's waited for a long time. You know, when I accepted Jesus, I was 10 years old. I accepted Jesus the first time I heard the invitation. My mother taught us about Jesus, and we knew all about Jesus and how he died for us and paid for our sins, but we didn't, hadn't accepted him into our heart. And you must be born again. As many as received him, to them gave he part of the sons of become the children of God. We have to receive him. And so I received the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when I did that, then I became his child. And it teaches us then that we become kind in our life and our lifestyle. It means that we be kind to God's children. You'll be more kind with your spouse and your wife and your children and you children maybe just shape up a little bit with your parents. And we're kind to God's people. Don't try to do it on your own strength. When you accept Jesus, then he gives us the help and the strength to carry on. 
And then it says, love suffereth long and is kind, love envieth not. That is, it's never jealous, it's never envious. It doesn't begrudge the greater privileges other people has. And it doesn't seek gain for itself. Love sees the inequalities of life. And I'm going to tell you, friend, there's a lot of inequalities in this path, in this journey that we call life. A lot of them everywhere. And yet love is never jealous of other people, never upset when other people teach them to mistreat them. If there is no love, there, there'll be envy and there'll be strife and there'll be one thing. And look at this, the very first parents, Adam and Eve have their children and Cain is jealous and envious of Abel and he kills him at the very dawn of human existence. Envy can invade the hearts of Christians and we have to be careful that we don't envy other people. Don't be jealous of other people, of their gifts and of their talents. Don't be jealous of their cars and their homes if they have them. If they have possessions and holdings, don't be jealous of those people. And if they have opportunities and breaks that come their way, don't be jealous of them. Rejoice for them and never be jealous of people because through love, we can be glad they have what they have and we're thankful what we have. And that's what St. Paul says. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And so Paul knew what it was to have much and he knew what it was to have nothing. He knew what it was to be in a dirty, stinking hole called a prison. And it was a slop place and it was a terrible place and it was hell on earth. But he was content because he had Christ and he knew that that was God's will for his life. And he never envied the king and the ace Caesar on his throne while he was in that pit. And what did he do in that prison? He wrote the epistles in the put in the New Testament that encourage all of us and bless and help us all. And then it says, prayer, and then love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed out up. That is, it's never boastful. It isn't proud. Moffat, a Bible scholar, says, love makes no parade, never shows off, never brags, even isn't high-minded and, and is conscious of others and of their needs and what they have to have. So love, love never shows off, off. It never brags. It's never conceited. It's never high-minded. It never looks down on others. And so we have to be very careful because there are so many times that we like to be patted on the back and we like all of the plaudits and we like the complaints and we like to have the praise of others. That just goes to that old nature and pretty soon we'll thrive on it and we look for it and we want it. And so we preach sermons that don't offend anybody so they pat us on the back and shame, shame. And so we don't look at other people. Think of the Lord Jesus Christ he never showed off. He never exalted and promoted himself. He laid aside his glory in heaven. He humbled himself for the sake of others. And so we have to look at ourselves and say, how are we doing? Are we happy where we are? Are we contented where we are and never jealous of the other person? And then Paul goes on in verse 4, and he says, love is not puffed up. A person with the love of God within his heart is never arrogant. There are so many people that are high-minded. They think they're so spiritual or they think they're smarter than somebody else because they have more money or more power or something like that. Love never is a show-off. Instead, love doesn't give us, uh, doesn't make us put on airs and make us look like we're so much. And the next time you see some big-time strutter go by, be sure that he doesn't know the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we hear of the Lord Jesus and we see his humble life and we see when he was born and came into this world, born of the Virgin Mary, and he's in a cow stable and he's the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords and he's the second person of the Holy Trinity taking on a human form and look at how humble he was. Jesus never showed pride and conceit, but he was a humble, loving, kind person. And then love does not behave itself unseemly, we're told, in verse 5. 
never haughty or selfish or rude. You know, we, not, we don't look down on the little things of life, the weird uh, the things of life. We accept what we have, give thanks for what we have. The little things, we careful how we live, the little, our manners from day to day, our attitude in the home with our children, with our spouse, and how we treat other people. So God help us if we have a, we're a part of the body of Christ and then if we go around and we show uh, that we're rude or we have uh, interruptions or we have sharp words or snide remarks or just plain old gossip, sharp tongues and short tempers and all of these things are found among the unsaved and, uh, and, and, uh, and the people that don't know Jesus Christ. How courteous are we anyway when we think about our Christian life? We, you remember that God says that, that pride comes before a fall, a haughty spirit before a fall. It says that God resisteth the proud. You want God to be against you? God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. That comes through real love. That's the way we'll be. And then in verse 5, it all says, seeketh not its own. Love forgets itself. Love is not selfish. We, we, so, how often we seek our own and we don't care for the others. And what did Jesus tell us? We're to love our neighbors as our neighbor is ourself. I don't think I love the neighbors I myself. I ought to, and I strive to do that. But that's why what we have to work toward. And we want to see then how we associate with our others, with other people. And we help them and we encourage them. And when they have advancements and so forth, we give thanks. Then Paul goes on and says, love is not easily provoked. That simply means that love is not bad-tempered. And how many times has temper ruined Christian homes and lives? Alan Redpath, the Bible scholar, comments on temper. He says, actually, there's no sin that is so disruptive a home, so spoils a Christian family, so ruins children in their upbringing as sheer bad temper. It is often excused as something that people cannot help, but it simply demonstrates a lack of Christian love. No, we may be angry at sin and injustice. That's another matter. But we can't be irritable and touchy and, vo and void of true love. And I read a one pastor, he says he's talking about the members of his church. And he says, I got to my church, I got members that are just like a bunch of balloons. I don't know which one's going to blow up next. And so there you are. They were, Jesus hated that sin of being proud and arrogant and touchy and big old babies and thin-skinned. Instead, when we have really love, we never, Jesus taught us that he was never angry at wrongs done to himself. He never struck back. And Isaiah said, as a sheep led to the slaughter, so he went and he never struck back, but he went to the slaughter and went to the cross, died for our sins. Oh, we have to have the love of Christ in our soul so we're not so easily provoked and so touchy and all of these things. And I'm going to tell you, dear friends, we need to really, we can't do it and always have the love of Christ. And we'll never have the love of Christ until we receive him into our heart. But God is love. And when we take God in our heart and take Jesus in our heart, we are taking that wonderful love, the love of God. And we can share it apart with other people and help other people. And that ought to be our goal. Then Paul goes on and says, love thinks no evil. Love keeps a close record of all kindnesses done but love forgets all ill brought our way. There's one translation that says, it does not hold grudges. We'll hardly even notice when others do it wrong. Love has the power to forgive and to forget. And Jesus came to blot out, out our transgressions and in doing so to forget them forever. When Jesus forgives us, they're all gone. And I think of my sins of the past and they're all gone. And Jesus says, of their sins and iniquities, will I remember no more. I'll forget them. They're washed clean. And that's how we have to live and not hold those grudges. Jesus shed, shed his blood to wash away my sins. And when he looks down, does he see my sins of the past? 
No, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ because I'm clothed in that righteousness, that wonderful righteousness of God. And so we have to be careful that we don't carry around. One man would call around, a, he said he had a hit list and he had those people that he was going to get even with. And I read about one woman, and she got rabies. And the doctor says, oh, you got rabies, you're going to die. There's nothing we can do with it. And she says, oh, I'm going to go home. i got to make my list. And she was making the list. And he says, what are you going to make a list of? He says, I'm, she says, I'm making a list of people I'm going to bite. And that's the way people are. They're just going around, see what, what troubles and evil they can bring into the world. Then Paul goes on. He says, love bears all things. Love suffers wrong without retaliation. It is a negative aspect, but it bears all things. It gets under the load. It gets under the burden. It's a positive aspect. There's a square one scripture writes this. A translation puts it this way. If you love someone, you'll be loyal to him no matter what the cost. You'll always believe in him, always expect the best of him, always stand your ground in defending him. Verse 7. Jesus was patient under so many wrongs, and he is our example, and he never struck back. And that's how you and I have to live, dear friends. Then he goes on in verse 7, and he says, Love believes all things, not that it is blind, not that it doesn't know right from wrong because it does, but it means that when we believe all things, that we're not basically suspicious of other people. And you'll hear a story about somebody and you say, well, I'm not surprised. I expected that of him, see? And we're looking with the long, we're looking with the jaundice eye and what we should be saying, I don't believe that. I'm not until I know it and I believe in him and I believe that he's sorry or I believe she's going to come around. I never will give up believing that. And so uh, it just look at this, how that Jesus taught us and always to forgive and to forget and to put it aside and care for him. Then he goes on and he says, it rejoiceth not in iniquity, rejoiceth in the truth. And the living Bible put it this way, it's never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. And I've been pr 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 quoting Moffat here, and he says, love is never glad when others go wrong. Love is gladdened by goodness. Love weeps over the weaknesses of other people. And when we see people taken into sin, we don't say, oh, I'm not surprised, or I, I, I didn't think he was genuine. No, when we see other weaknesses, people in weaknesses and others, we don't expose and flout them before other people, but instead we believe that that person is going to come right and we pray for that person, and we rejoice when they come around. And there's great power in prayer if we would just pray for these people and help them to come around. And then finally, he says, love, verse 7, love endures all things. Love cannot be conquered. You just cannot beat it. It stays there, and it won't give up. This means that with the one you trusted and has let you down, you love that person and you believe in that person and you pray for that person. And when the one who has high hopes for falls flat, and believe me, it could be you and it could be me. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We don't know, you don't know how far you could go into sin and I don't either. And my 95 years old, I'm praying to God I won't do something stupid. And I've done enough already for two lifetimes and that I will be careful that I won't bring any disgrace against the name of Jesus Christ in the church. That's what we believe. And so we endure all things and we believe all things. God is love. And, and but this is, I'm going to tell you this, friend, that wonderful love of God. I don't care how far you go into sin and I don't care what you've done. He loves you and he'll take you back. Or if you've never received him, he'll take you but I'm going to tell you something about the love of God. That love of God for the unsaved, for that person that's a deep in and never accepted Jesus Christ, it's going to end when you die. Now, for the Christian, that love of God will never end. But to the unsaved, when you die after death, the judgment. And so we're praying that you come to the Lord Jesus Christ 
and that you'll accept him as your personal savior. And how do you do that? You pray, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I ask you to come into my heart and take away my sins. And he'll do that. And then you promise to serve him the best you can. Turn from your sins and serve him. You'll never be perfect, but you strive for it. And if you do that, you write to us and we'll send you literature. You write to the Christian Worship Hour. And the box is 2002-2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402. And we need to hear from you. We need your prayers and we need your gifts. We're not underwritten by any organization or denomination or corporation, but we're just depending on God's people. And we handle the money carefully because we're a member of the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, and they audit our books. Every penny we take in and every penny we spend, and they t t check us as close as you can imagine. So you write to us and you help us, a Christian worship hour. It's on the screen there, box 2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402. And we're going to be looking for you. And then you can ask for the new song. It's a little Bible study. It's free and postpaid. So we hope that you won't forget us. You'll stand by and help us. Now I want to close with a prayer. And everywhere, every time we pray, we pray for the persecuted church. We're praying for the persecuted church in Nigeria. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the wonderful grace of God. We thank you for the love of God that dwells in our hearts when we receive you. And we just pray that you'll help all of us to trust you and love you. We pray for the persecuted church in Nigeria. And Lord, we just give them strength and courage. I know you will. And help them to know that they're encouragement to all of us. Be with those who are on beds of sickness and those that are lonely and weary. Bless the young people as they face the temptations of life. And we'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So we want to thank you all for standing by. Thank you for your letters. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your prayers. And tell your other friends about the Christian Worship Hour because next week we're going to be talking about growing in grace, becoming a better Christian. And there's some things in the Bible that help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's going to be what we look at next week. So until then, we'll be thinking about you and want you to know that God loves you, and we want you to know the Christian worship hour loves you, and we're praying for you as you pray for us, and God bless you all. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. My dad loved to preach because he got to tell people of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. If you would like to learn more about having a relationship with Jesus and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, click the encouragement link on our website at cwh.org. You may also stream more programs, subscribe to our monthly newsletter, and view Pastor Salem's devotions and answers. We would be most grateful if you would pray for this ministry and help us financially to continue proclaiming the gospel. God bless you.